uh, with the slide before this was this re-explanation of the attenuation of x-rays as a function of distance through a material mm -hmm. uh, such that the intensity that you measure at your detector is proportional to the intensity of from the source multiplied by the amount of or the diminution of signal through absorption right and and it was a number between zero and one and this is that number um if we look at our goal so here is a a function in space in the plane we'll look at a one single two-dimensional slice of the patient in this example so there's no information really in depth perpendicular to the page here. It's just X and Y. Uh, we're going to parameterize this plane uh, with uh, the variables theta and L, okay, such that uh, if I define an angle theta and a position L along this uh, vector, uh, I can draw a perpendicular down through the patient in this direction. Okay, and that gives me a basically a projection line through the patient. Let me get the red laser pointer here. So all of the points uh, along this line will be parameterized uh, in this. Well, exciting. That sounded more exciting. Um, okay, so this is where this formula uh, for a line that we that we looked at back in our looking at our mathematical tools section uh, comes into play in that every X and Y value that satisfies this condition when you set a theta, right? And an L, those set of X and Y points are along this line, okay? So it's just an, it's just an alternative equation for a line in the plane. You can actually write it out if you wish is Y equals MX plus B. Uh, and so all of the points along this line are here. Uh, we're going to measure, as you might imagine, we're going to send x-rays from our source up here. They're going to come through a straight line, hit the patient here. Some will be absorbed and then x-rays will be emitted out the back of the patient, those that didn't get absorbed, okay? And then we'll detect them on our detector and the position at which we detect them will be parameterized by this value of L, okay? So there's one scalar value here, L and an angle theta. So we're going to change that angle and measure a number of those projections, okay? So let's look at how we uh, quantify what we're going to measure coming out of the, the patient and onto our detector. Uh, we start with this complex equation that is is the equation for the whole thing, and that is energy density. So if I have a set of photons coming out with relative numbers given by this probability density function, which is S as a function of uh, energy, the energy itself at each point, because higher energy photons make a brighter intensity on your detector, and then the attenuation of those x-rays through the sample and S is a parameter that we're just going to use as an integration constant uh, or an integration variable uh, to move through the sample. And we'll go from zero to some depth. And the mu values actually are dependent on energy. As we discussed before, we're going to simplify this and say we're going to pick, we're going to solve for mu values at the average energy of this uh, spectrum. So if this is my average energy, I am gonna solve for the mu value at that average energy, okay, when we do this. So when we get rid of that, so we, we don't need to consider this uh, integral anymore. We'll just say we'll set one energy, it'll be the average energy, and we'll calculate a mu value at that energy. The equation simplifies to this. So we have an intensity of illumination from our from our X-ray tube, and the intensity at the detector, and then this uh, fraction which reduces that intensity. So this is what we measure 
at the detector. So if I go back to this drawing, and if my detector is here, right, what comes out? So I not intensity of x-rays enter the patient here. They get absorbed as we move through. And then what in, comes out of the back is the intensity ID. And that's what we measure at that, <laughs> at that detector. And so this is this intensity here. We can uh, simplify this equation to some extent by uh, dividing both sides by I naught. So now I have a fractional change in intensity, uh, which is just what I measure divided by what I put in. So this is a number between zero and one. So if half the photons get absorbed, this number would be 0.5, right? Uh, and we know what the expression is for that. It's just an exponential, you know, it's a mono exponential given by this equation. So if we take the log of this, then what that does is it gets rid of the exponent and we call that G of D after we take the log and put a negative sign. And what we're left with is just the integral of mu through the material, right? So this is called, this is the actual data that we will use to um, uh, use as raw data for the inversion to get the image, okay? It's this stuff. And this is called logged data. So when you get data off the uh, CT machine and it's in pure raw format, it's usually a set of essentially shadow grams, right? They're shadows. So what you do is you, you do this, you divide by the intensity of the X-ray two for each point and you take the log multiply by a negative because this is between zero and one. And then you get a positive number. And that positive number is the data we're gonna use uh, to reconstruct our picture, okay? And it's called the logged data. Uh, all of these numbers are positive, right? And it's a, they're all real numbers. They don't have phase or anything like that. We haven't, we haven't measured any kind of phase shift. They're just a set of real numbers, right? So going back to our, the geometry and the, how we're gonna set up the math for doing this, uh, we now have uh, the intensity coming in here is I naught. It gets, a, the X-rays get absorbed fractionally. And, and when they emerge from here, we get this ID. And then what we're going to plot as a function of L along our detector array is this G D. Okay, so that's that number right there. Okay. Uh, we will perform this same operation. We'll, we'll parameterize the location of all of our detectors along this line, right? So we might have a thousand detectors along this line. And so L will go from a low number to a high number as we go along there. And we will uh, take multiple measurements at different angles theta. So here's a, an example of an object in a CT scanner. And we'll, we're gonna take a look at this object and it's, uh, how do I get rid of this? I think it's terrible. Winner. <laughs> okay, now I can't get rid of the laser. Uh, does anyone remember how to do this? Gosh, I don't know. Because I want to control the thing now. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to get rid of this late. Huh? Oh, no, I don't see where you are here. All right. Here. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, so I get these things. You know, this crap. Now I got a pen. <laughs> All right, here we go. Sorry about that. Uh, you'd think after like 10 years of doing this, you'd remember how to do that crap. Okay. Uh, so this object, three-dimensional object, we printed it on a, uh, a you know, a, a resin printer. And it has a, a volume inside that looks like a sine wave. So it's sort of like an hourglass. 
And uh, this is the cap and, and it's brighter inside because it, it's filled with contrast agent. And the uh, these features right here are pacing leads. And so we're this is from data when we're trying to figure out how to get rid of artifact and pacing leads because they're metal. And so they absorb a lot of x-rays. They cause streaks and things like that. Uh, and so you can see the three-dimensional geometry of the object, right? And what we're going to show here is the true measured raw data from the scanner, okay, of that object. So uh, without doing really any, you know, logging or any, any kind of uh, post-production. And so... At each angular view of the source and the gantry, we get a projection and a shadowgram through that object. Yeah? Um, so I, I always thought that the raw data that comes out is actually a diagram from the CT. Is that not the case? Nope. Okay. So, so, they, well, so they actually give you this? You can, we're going to create a sinogram from this data. Okay, so they don't actually give you this. Right? Not really, not in sinogram form. You can plot it in, as a sinogram. Mm -hmm. So what this is, you know, when, when you think about it, it's pretty simple. This is just like x-rays, 2D x-rays taken at different angles through the sample. Yeah. That's it, right? And uh, the reason this is dark and will have lower numbers in the encoding, whatever the manufacturer uses to encode the signal that they've measured, uh, these have lower numbers because fewer x-rays hit the detector right here. And the reason fewer x-rays hit is because there's a piece of wire there, right? And so the contrast produces a good shadow. The patient table produces a pretty good shadow, especially when it's at an orientation like that, right? So when you're going through a lot of patient table, it, it absorbs a lot of x-rays. And you can see when we rotate away to different angles, it's it's somewhat transparent to x-rays. Um, and then you can see in the background also, there's this interesting pattern in that there's a bright signal here, which means a lot of x-rays hit the detector right here. And then as I move out to the farther reaches of this detector, the number of x-rays hitting drops off, okay? And this is, an, is created by the manufacturer through a thing called a bow tie filter. And it essentially lets more x-rays go through the center of the field of view than out in the peripheral part of the field of view. Partly because a, a lot of times you're imaging stuff like the, the heart or something like that, you don't really care about irradiating the outside the arm and, and stuff like that. So you, you focus your x-rays towards the center. You still measure some x-rays out here so that you reconstruct a picture Right, and you don't get artifacts. However, the uh, signal to noise is dropped out there. Right, um, <clears throat> so that's why there's an uneven sort of sensitivity back here. If you zoom into this, you can actually see a rectilinear grid. Remember, we saw those kind of chip things that they they put in there. You can actually see the pattern of those chips chips there. Uh, and so here we're just rotating around you know, a few times to get enough projections to make an image. And so this is what's reconstructed from that, right? This looks a little different and uh, this is a human and you can see that there's a heart, there's a diaphragm here. Uh, the spine will come into view, see the spine back there. Uh, and this is the same number of views, however, this data is different in that we have taken the log of the data, right? We've divided by I naught and we have taken the log multiplied by negative one and we get this data. So now the brightness corresponds to the amount of X-ray attenuation. And if the brightness is high, that means there's a lot of attenuation. If the brightness is low, that means there's not a lot of attenuation. Um, so one question you might all wonder right now is, well, how do you know what this number is? Like you're saying, we're dividing by it. What is that number? I know it. And the, re the way you get that number is at the beginning of each day, somebody does a warm-up scan on the scanner and they image air, right? And so 
I naught is the value you get when you turn your scanner on and there's nothing inside, right? It's just the photons just go straight to the detector. And so you make that measurement every day. And that's called an air scan, right? And you need to do it because if you're going to divide, you actually don't really divide by a constant over every detector. You divide by the individual I naught for that detector, right? Because it has a dif differential gain because of electronics, because of the way the crystal was formed, et cetera. So you compensate for those differential gains. Every detector gets its own I naught. Right from the air scan. Um, one other thing that's interesting is that if you look at the quality of the data, say right here, uh, and so now we're we're essentially shooting X-rays through the back of the patient and through a lot of tissue, right? So it's solid tissue all the way through the back of the patient, and here there's some lung, and so there's a lot of space where it's almost air. And what if I, it's probably not visible here. Well, it is kind of visible, but the quality of the data, the noise is a little high right here, right? So it looks a little choppy, a little noisy. And the reason is we're running out of photons at this point, right? So it's basically the patient is thick enough there and our X-ray tube is not, is, is on to a certain level of intensity such that we run out of photons at the detector. And so it starts to get a bit noisy, right? Not a bit noisy, a lot noisy. Okay. Um, so you do want to try and manage the amount of photons that you dial up while you're making an image such that you get photons on your detector, right? Uh, and so it depends on the size of the patient. If you have a big patient, you're going to crank it up, put more photons through just so you get, get some out, okay? So this is kind of neat, right? It's it's like uh, you know a thousand chest X-rays taken at slightly different angles, right? That's that's basically what it is. Right? So for the rest of this lecture and pretty well the whole course, uh, we're only going to focus on this thin red line here. Okay, this detector has two hundred fifty-six detector elements from here to here. This is the patient's head this way, their feet this way. So it's a it's a slab like this, and the, there's a point source, and so there's a fan beam in this direction, right? So these X-rays are kind of coming in at an angle, right? In Z, they're not straight straight along. So we're gonna, for math's sake, because it gets really complicated, really horrible to deal with all of these fan beams in multiple directions, we're going to look at the math in this one plane, right? Where the x-rays are coming straight down through the patient. So the image that we'll look at will have two uh, spatial variables, x and y, and that, and it'll be an axial plane through the scanner, okay? In the projects, you can look at uh, the difference between fan beam scanning and parallel uh, X-ray beam scanning, uh, and if you want, you can look at full. It's called cone beam CT, which is when you have a fan beam in theta in X and Y, and a fan beam in Z. Now I have a cone of X-rays, and you can imagine if I take an object and I move it up and down in the cone, the zoom goes goes up and down on my projection. So if I have an object that's displaced from the center, when the detector is over here, it looks small on the detector. And when the, the detector's down here, it looks large. And so the thing changes its size as you, you go around. So all of that stuff has to be compensated for, right? From a mathematical standpoint, we're always going to take the data back to the condition where we had a single source and a single detector and a straight line path. That's, that's mathematically where we're going with that. So here we are back in two dimensions. Right, so along that red line, we have our X-rays coming in, coming through, hitting the detector, right? And then we do our log and we get that G value. And then along that line, this would be the brightness as a function of uh, position along our detector, okay? Um, 
<clears throat> so now, if we do say a thousand angles, so theta, you know, goes through a thousand values, and we have a thousand detectors, so L has a thousand different values. If we just discretize this thing, we now have a two-dimensional function, g L theta, right? And uh, and it's a set of these brightnesses as a function of L and theta. Our job is to figure out how to take that raw data and turn it into a map of the linear attenuation coefficient as a function of position in the plane. So that's the basic CT image reconstruction task, right? We've got all these projections. We turn them into linear attenuation coefficients. So you can you can see this is pretty good, right? We're, we're pretty close where there's a lot of relationships between G and linear attenuation, right? It's right here, right, in the formula, right? So this is what G equals. It's the sum of a whole set of linear attenuation coefficients along a line. So it's not a, not a stretch, right, that we should be able to, with a lot of measurements, figure out what all these linear attenu attenuation coefficients are, given many, many measurements of G. So let's look at uh, geometry just for a second. For our reconstruction purposes, we're going to assume we're in this geometry, which means it, this is L, this is my detector along this way. And as I raster through different angles, right, uh, I will get a, a set of values of the, that G of D function along L. So here we're at say theta equals 90, my detectors along this way, my x-rays are projected down this way. And that gives me one uh, set of numbers in the GL theta plane. Then I rotate my source and my detectors such that I'm at 120 degrees. Same thing, I just map uh, the measurements as a function of L for that theta. So that's each projection gives me a vertical line through GL theta here. That's not how we obtain data. This is how we obtain data in a modern CT scanner. We have a point source and the, the X-rays come out in a geometry called a fan beam, okay? And so you can see when I take, if L is the distance along here now, along my detector, uh, I have many thetas for this particular view. Right, so this theta could be 90 degrees, but then I have 90 minus some angles to get this and 90 plus to get these angles. So I have many angles sam sam uh, sampled simultaneously here for this one measurement, right? And what that boils down to is for a, for a single measurement, when I measure along L, I get a whole set of angles. Right. So here's my GL theta plane. And instead of sampling along vertical lines, when I do fan beam, I sample along these angled lines. Uh -huh. Right. So that's not too complicated. Right. We just have to fill up GL theta. And it, we're going to do it by stepping across different angles this way. And we're going to fill it up along these angled lines as opposed to these vertical lines. When we're about to reconstruct the picture though, we assume that we, we can look down a vertical line and we have all of these measurements, right? Now, when I look down a vertical line here for a specific theta in GL theta, those measurements were taken at different times, okay? So that can, that can lead to some problems if the, if the object is moving or something like that, right? That these uh, measurements were along this one, vertical line are taken at different times. It's kind of true of these measurements in that I take all of these very quickly, like in one snapshot, but then by the time I get to these, it, some time has passed, right? So there's still going to be artifacts, you know, from things that change as a function of time. Okay, so that's the fan beam architecture. There is very explicit uh, 
algebraic ways to just turn your data obtained like this into data that's assumed to be taken like this. Okay, as you can imagine, just mapping these points over to here. Um, <clears throat> okay, I, I think we just went through the whole explanation. Um, okay, so what we're going to wind up with is estimates of the linear attenuation coefficient mu for our target voxel and whatever material is in that voxel, be it muscle, bone, water, uh, we're going to get a mu value. And in the early days of CT, uh, you know, this was in the 70s, right? And so computers really worked on integers, you know, efficiently in the 70s, not a, not a floating point, right? And so what they did was they, so you have a, an estimate of a mu value and instead of just displaying that as a value, they displayed that as a fractional change from the water mu value. Okay, so they would take the mu value you get, the solution, subtract water, divide by water, so it's a fractional difference from water, multiply by a thousand, and that gives you a thing called a CT number or a Hounsfield unit. Okay, and to this day, when you bring up a CT in OSIRIS or any kind of viewer, the pixels are in Hounsfield units. And it's kind of convenient because they're constant, right? They, you know, fat is fat in Hounsfield units, right? Um, it gives you, the fact it's multiplied by a thousand gives you uh, air is minus a thousand, right? Because mu is zero for air. Uh, and water is zero. Okay, so if mu, if I substitute mu water here, I get zero for this number. So the Hounsfield unit of water is zero. The Hounsfield unit of the background air is minus a thousand. Okay. Uh, soft tissue units, sort of somewhere anywhere from minus a hundred to usually a couple hundred Hounsfield units. But it's it's more interesting to look at a picture like this. So here is a modern CT image. And we'll look at when you put a region of interest here and ask, well, what's the, the pixel values here? Uh, in skeletal muscle, in this patient, it's 105 Hounsfield units, okay? So there's slightly more attenuation here than in water, right? Uh, remember, water would be zero. Fat, in this subcutaneous fat here, the Hounsfield unit is minus 120 which means there's slightly less attenuation than in water, right? The blood pool, the Hounsfield unit is up to 650. And that's not just unadulterated human blood. That is blood that has been mixed with a contrast agent. So you inject a contrast agent into the patient, it goes into their heart and it creates a, a really good shadow which maps to this Hounsfield unit, right? So a lot more attenuation than in water. Uh, myocardium is 120, which is about the same as skeletal muscle. If you look at this very bright object that's in this patient's aorta, so their aorta is this nice smooth tube, but it's got this like hard object on the wall, and that's a calcification. And so that is way up at 1300. And one of the metallic leads on this patient's chest is 5,000 Hounsfield units. So it's a lot more attenuation than water, okay? So you can see these are nice integer numbers, right? And so if you had a 1970s computer with eight bits or, or let's say 10 bits, I guess, you know, you could encode all of this stuff, right? Uh, nowadays, you know, you could just do it as mu for that matter. Lung, if we go down to the background and what we're changing here, is see the window level is at 300 Hounsfield units and our width is 1500. And that produces this look, this grayscale look. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, does the fact that I measure, say, 120 or 105 Hounsfield units here take into account 
the fact that the x-rays have gone through a heck of a lot of material, no matter which direction we scan from, right? To get to this, this location. And yes, the answer is yes. And um, that is the essence of the reconstruction is that our data is the sum of the attenuation through say for one angle through all of these voxels, like, you know, a lot, 500 voxels, right? And it's the sum of the attenuation through all those. But we get enough of them that we can do this inversion to figure out which one is which, right? And that's that's the essence of the reconstruction. And there, there's also a subtlety to that in that, and we'll look at this, is that if I had an X-ray beam and it came from this direction and it went all the way through all of this iodinated blood, all the way through, all the way through, and then by the time it got to this tissue here, the X-ray beam has changed its character quite a bit. And the reason it's changed its character is a lot of the lower energy X-rays are gone, right? So you get differential absorption of low energy X-rays versus high as you're going through this. And so the X-ray beam that hits this tissue for that angle is different than the X-ray beam that hits this tissue from the opposite direction because you haven't had time to absorb of all, all of that uh, low energy x-rays, right? So that's called beam hardening. It's, a, it's an artifact. If we look down and we, we put our window level all the way down to 500, negative 500, so that all of this stuff looks equally bright, same window width of 1400, we can see what's in the lungs because before we couldn't really see what's going on down there. So we'll just go down to the wind, you know, minus 500. And so you see all the vascular structure in the lungs and the lung tissue, the parenchyma itself has about minus 800. So if it was pure air, it would be minus 1000. It's not pure air. It's got a little bit of tissue in it. So it's minus 800. Up here, the pure air is minus 1000. Okay. Um, and so normally when uh, folks like those ex clinical examples we saw at the beginning of the course, you know, when we're looking at COVID in the lungs and things like that, radiologists require two different displays. They'll display an image like this to look at the structure that's in the lungs. And then they'll display an image like this to look at the structure of the tissues, All right? So you, to get the detail, your own dynamic range is very hard to put all of that dynamic range in one picture. Okay, so getting back to your question is like, well, if we have just these projections, you know, that's the sum of all this attenuation, how do we invert our data such that we get an estimate of mu at a specific location? So we're gonna start out, and this is just how this works in principle. And, you know, you do it for this trivial problem and the principle is the same for a really big problem, right? So let's suppose we have an object and we're gonna break it into four pixels. So we'll get four estimates of mu values that will be unique, right? And to do that, we'll take data where we have a X-ray source and we project and we get that G function here for this projection on our detector below these. And on our detector here, we get G2, okay? Now we're going to move our X-ray source and our detector such that we project we get G3, which is a combination of these two attenuations, and G4, which is a combination of these two attenuations. So remember, so this is what integration is when you have discrete things. We just add up those, those mu values, right? So G1 is mu1 plus mu2. G2 is mu3 plus mu4. G3, mu1 plus mu3, and mu2 plus mu4. So here I've got a set of equations now. I have measured these. I want to know these, right? So I have four measurements. I have four unknowns, right? And four equations. So by algebra, we should be able to do that, right? We should be able to just in, invert this thing just by writing it. You've all, those of you who've taken linear algebra, right? Have done a bazillion of these where you create this matrix, right? And, and this is your A matrix and this is your input here and your output, we have these, we're solving for these. So 
So you should be able to invert that. Those of you who've taken algebra a lot, right, will look at this and go, oh, there's something wrong here, right? And that is that this system of equations, right, is, is not independent. I can derive one of these from the other three. So that, that's a problem, right? So if you here, these should be Gs. G4 is G1 plus G2 minus G3. So this matrix here is not full rank, right? So what we have to do is we have to take another measurement this way, right? So now we're going to have a, a projection measurement here, right? And we'll replace that equation in here. And it turns out that now this thing is full rank and we can perform that. So we were undersampled before. We didn't have enough angles, right? Now we've got this, th this third angle and we've been able to measure all of our mu values. So in principle, right, we can do this for any size, right? We could do this for a 10 by 10. We could do this for 100 by 100. But what the images that we're reconstructing are usually 512 by 512 or 1K by 1K, right? Now, nowadays, we're going up to 1K by 1K. So at 512 by 512, this matrix, which is like the system matrix, becomes pretty big, right? It's N squared by N squared, which is 262,000 by 262,000. Okay, so that's a big matrix. Right. So inverting a 262,000 squared matrix isn't something you just go invert <laughs> and it happens. Right. Particularly if there is uncertainty or noise in the measurements. OK, so if if these things have a little bit of jitter on them because you have noise, then trying to solve that that matrix becomes a little a little rough. And so that's not really done. Um, Perhaps as computers get bigger and bigger, uh, going back to direct inversion to, to reconstruct these pictures might become in fashion. But my prediction is long before that, deep learning is going to just take all of this out of, out of you know, our hands, right? In that, you will just give it the raw data and say, what does that picture look like? Given the 9 million pictures you've reconstructed in the past, and it will just give you the picture, right? So uh, that, as you can imagine, any inversion like this, like a Fourier transform or any kind of transform, you could teach a deep learning network to do on noisy data, right? Because you can create data and just teach it and teach it and teach it until finally it just knows how to do it really well. And it's cheap, right? Once once you've trained a network, you know this inversion is super expensive. Like it takes you know a really heavy duty computer at the scanner and takes an hour, something like that. Whereas deep learning would take you know twelve seconds or something to to give you an image. So uh, people gave up on this, particularly back in the days when we had, we only had like. Texas Instruments TI-50 calculators and went to something far more simple, which is called back projection. And this is called naive back projection. And it's, it's kind of cool. It works uh, to a certain extent. And that is if now I have a three by three and we're going to do exactly the same thing as we did on the previous slide, we're going to have a projection through here, 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 right? And then vertically and then diagonally, okay? So if I project through here, I get a zero, right? If I project through here, I get a three, right? In terms of my attenuation, right? So the mu value is three. What I don't know about, I know that this is three, this is my data. It could be many things, right? They could all be ones. I could have a two here, a one here, a zero here, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I don't really know what this looks like in this dimension. I do know that the sum is three, right? zero and the same for these same for these so here's a trivial way to create a picture from these measurements what we'll do is for each one of these projections we will just back project it back onto the space from which it came 
and will evenly distribute the mu values everywhere along that line. Okay, so here I got a three. I have no idea where they came from. So what I'll do is I'll put a one. I'll just divide it up into three buckets because I've got three pixels here and put a one in each each bucket. That's my best guess, right? Because uh, and then I take this data. I got a three from this, and I say, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna spread that data evenly across this projection. So I'll add a one here. I'll add a one here. That now becomes two because I already had a one there, right? And I'll have a one here because I had a zero there, right? Then we'll take a vertical projection. I'll project it back. I'll add a one here because it was a zero. Now this becomes three because it used to be two. So I added one. Now I add one here. That becomes a one, right? And similarly for this one, a one, four, one, right? So we've done a trivial thing, right? And we get an image that's not too bad, right? I mean, it's got a peak in the middle. It's got a kind of a uniform baseline. Uh, but importantly, it is not the object, right? It is an incorrect image, but it is related to the object by something, right? And so it's it's interesting when you do this, take this to the limit and you say, okay, we'll just do this projection, this naive projection with many, many projections, right? And so if we have a disk in the plane at some location and we take a projection here and I look along L and I see, oh, I've got brightness at a certain L here. And this uh, blob function there is what the integral of a disk looks like as you go from, so if I have a disk like this and I go from left to right through the disk, I get an integral that looks like that. It has a round top with a peak. And so that's the integral. And I'll just back project that function back through every voxel in this direction, right? Change the angle, I get a new, version of this function in the sense that it's displaced on L here, but I'll back project that. It's the same function as this because uh, as I rotate around, a, a disk looks like a disk and the integral through the disk doesn't change, right? It's circularly symmetric. So I'll project that back and it looks like that. And then I'll do it for a different angle it's at a different L, I project that back. Yeah. So here I've done three projections. And I have a very simple object, granted, right? Uh, but I know where that object is, right? I kind of know how wide it is, right? So I know it's down here, right? So it's not bad. So what happens if I do like 500 projections and back project them all? I get this. It isn't the object, right? But it does show you where the object is. Like you've got a peak right here that's right on dead center of that circle. Right. But these edges here don't look anything like a circle, right? They they sort of roll off like this. And there's this stuff in the background. So you can imagine like all of this stuff is is back here. Right. And so it it's a very blurry version of your object. It's called naive back projection. Um, we're gonna do this, we'll do this later, uh, when we talk about the radon transform. Okay. So um, I want to discard those. Okay. Six. Okay. Okay. So here we are. We've got our our version of the disk in the plane, which is a blurred thing with a peak and a bad background. So here, this is, this is a really cool animation. This is uh, a back projection of intensities, those G one dimensional intensities through a human head at one angle, okay? And now what we're going to do is we're going to apply data from different angles as a function of time. Oops, that didn't work. As a function of time. And just add them up, right? 
and you get this, right? So what's happening here is we have a few angles more, you can see the source and the detector are rotating. And what's quite interesting about this, if we stop say here, is that certain features already have very precise, you know, estimations. Like for instance, this edge here is really sharp, right? And the reason that edge is really sharp is it's tangent to those projections that we've been taking, right? And so you get really good information about where the heck that edge is from those tangents. The edges of this person's head that are over here haven't been sampled yet. We haven't gone to a region where we could we could see an edge. And so we really don't know anything about what the content is in this direction, other than very rough you know, estimates. So as we add those up and rotate, we see that details fill in at different angles, right? And this, this, uh, this is using a form of back projection called convolution back projection, which we will now learn. Okay, so you can see down here. There's still sort of a dark, dark zone there that that fills in with the last few projections there. And now you get really nice, nice details. So to look at convolution back projection and how you actually reconstruct the true object, not the from the naive back projection, they're very closely related. Uh, we're gonna take a look at the raw data and uh, we can organize the raw data, G L theta, uh, into what's called a sinogram. And a sinogram, uh, is a set of the measurements and they are stacked so that uh, we uh, plot theta in one direction and L in another direction. And as we uh, accumulate different theta, we just stack them up as a function of L and theta. And so that function there is called the sinogram. Uh, so Here's a projection, you know, if we look at the intensity along this line, right, it is a, a, a projection through the entire object. And you can ask the question just from this sinogram, which angle is that projection, right? Uh, and there are some clues uh, to how you would figure out which angle the projection is. Uh, for example, the edge, this edge seems to be oscillating like a sine wave, right? Where it's its widest is probably a projection that's going down this way because that's where the object is widest. And where it's narrowest is where these, you know, uh, are, you know, at the narrowest uh, aspect of the object. So that projection would be this way. And so now you have to decide, well, you know, is it a projection this way through the object, or is it a projection this way through the object? And what does that even mean? <laughs> right? You know, because they're identical, right? If if everything was um, kosher, they if we had parallel lines like this, the parallel line and forgetting about uh, beam hardening going through this way, the data would equal the parallel line going through this way. Okay, so we have a symmetry in the data. Hence, you actually only need 180 degrees to, to uh, reconstruct a full image, right? You don't need 360 degrees. Um, and so one, one hint, like if we say, okay, L is along one of these directions. And so A, you know, L is small here, large here. Uh, and we've plotted our data such that this is in MATLAB. So zero zero is up here in this corner. Theta gets larger as we go this way. L gets larger as we go this way. Uh, so when we look at all of these possibilities, we see that um, L has some crap over here. When L is large, this junk's over here and it's over here. Uh, at this view. And so that's where L is small. So this would tell me that if L is this way and I've got large L values, then this is all this stuff projected down, right? So at this view is what we're looking at. 
here. And if you want to figure out where this angle is, right? For a simple object like this, uh, you can see these two sine waves in the sinogram, and that's why it's called a sinogram, right? Is that a, a, a sort of uniform object or a pixel actually paints a sine wave in this sinogram space. Um, <clears throat> so where do these two objects cross over? Right, so that's when they're superimposed. So this projection is either right here or it's right here, right? Because that's where those two things cross over. And you can see the various elements of this object such that these are very bright objects that are like ribs and they form these sine waves here. Uh, you've seen the two dark, dark ones. This is a very low contrast object. There's a disc there and it is very hard to see it right in the sinogram. In fact, I can't really point it out in the sinogram. I don't know if anybody else sees it, uh, but they're, they're really low contrast. And one of the things about sinograms is it's a single projection. And so that low contrast in a single projection, sometimes you can't even see it really. You, you need to do the reconstruction to add up all of those effects in order to, to see the difference uh, of the, the contrast. Uh, so sometimes when you're, you're thinking, you know what, if I have this object in my patient and I know where it is, et cetera, I'll just look at the sinogram and I'll be able to pick off that object. It's very difficult to do because it's, it is distributed across a sine wave throughout that whole raw data. So it, until you do the inversion, sometimes it's hard to actually see that it's even there. Uh, Sinograms, th this is a really simple one because we have very discrete objects and a very uniform background. Uh, here we have a whole set. They're discrete again, but there's many more of them. And so depending on the angle, you will get a more complex interference between all of these uh, absorbers. And so the sinogram for this object looks like this. So again, in, in this diagram from the textbook, theta is in this direction right, going north, L is in this direction. Okay? So as we change our angle and paint different L measurements, uh, we see a function that looks like this. So a really amazing CT physics person could look at this sinogram and know that's the picture. Right? Although I don't, I doubt that's true. <laughs> right? You know, you could do this one, in your head, right? Because you have very discrete things. You go, oh, I know it's a, you know, it's some kind of ellipse because it's got this wavy thing. And I know inside that ellipse, there's a couple of dark things, etc. If you looked at that sinogram and say, well, what's that? It's probably very difficult to do that in your head, right? You can try though. You can, you know, build up a whole library of, of things. Okay, if we look at uh, naive back projection uh, and see what that gives us with a complex object like this, this is in the textbook, so you can read this uh, description in the textbook. Um, this function is one back projection, okay, a single back projection from one view, okay. Uh, that view was taken at theta, right? And uh, the function that we're showing here is uh, basically this is a parameterization of L, right? So I have an X, Y plane here. I plug it in X and Y with this equation, I get L, right? And uh, for a specific theta parameterization. And so that gives me this 2D function in X and Y and it's parameterized by theta, okay? Um, if what I do is I just add up, if I do say a thousand thetas and I add up all thousand or 
you know, we do continuous calculus, we integrate over theta. Uh, this is what it, our final image looks like. So I integrate over theta from zero to 180 degrees, and I just add up each one of these functions. Uh, so I get a sum, and that sum is called a laminogram, which is here, and it looks like this. And you can see the it it looks somewhat like our object, right? It's pretty pretty good actually, except the there's a lot of blurring and there's a lot of background haze uh, in this object. Uh, we will look. Uh, there is a uh, in the materials this week. There's a uh, um, MATLAB script. There's two MATLAB scripts. And you can go into those scripts and uh, you know look at what a sinogram looks like for a set of discrete points. Look at what it looks like after you filter in the raw data. Look at adding noise and things like that. Uh, so we'll go through the demo of those things uh, if, uh, at the end of this or at the beginning of next lecture. Okay. Uh, but what we're going to do now is we get continue on our quest to figure out how to get the correct inversion, not these uh, blurry laminograms. We want to get the correct inversion to, to get the object back from our raw data. So in the, this is here because the book uses this notation. So we have an object in the plane we're trying to reconstruct. We're gonna, the book calls that FXY. It has a Fourier transform, capital F of mu and mu, right? And um, there's an interesting theorem that uh, states the following. That is, if I have a projection through this object fxy, such that I get this gl theta uh, in this direction, if I take the one dimensional Fourier transform as a function of L, okay, so L is like the spatial variable now. So I'm going to get a conjugate uh, K variable in K space. So I take the Fourier transform of this thing. It turns out that when you plot that Fourier transform over here in Fourier space, it turns out to be a sample through on a straight line through the Fourier transform of your object. This is called the projection slice theorem. And uh, it is fundamental to CT reconstruction, like under understanding this. It's, um, I don't think there is a intuitive or gestalt way to explain why this works, right? That I can perform all of these integrals across my object and then plot those sums in this direction. Take the Fourier transform of that thing, and it turns out to be a sample of the Fourier transform of the entire object in the Fourier space. Right? That's it's a pretty cool theorem, right? That that it would work is not obvious to to me. This in the book, you can algebraically follow the uh, proof here, and this is these are the equation numbers in the book uh, to show that that is true. Okay, so you really only have to write down the equation for these integrals, put it, put that into the Fourier transform formula to show that it works out that you are along a line in the Fourier space. Okay, and that's what they've done here. Okay, they've shown that if you do those integrals with GL theta, you substitute in what GL theta is, you get that uh, results come out. So you're welcome uh, to do that, to, to look at this proof, but we're gonna, we're gonna assume that it's true, okay? Um, okay, so let's move to our notation that, that we're using uh, in the lectures. So here's our object. It's the attenuation coefficient as a function of position uh, in space. Uh, these, this function is the GL theta function that uh, we have an expression for, we've learned. 
the Fourier transform of this, of our image that we want is given by uh, capital U, KX and KY. And to um, express what, what is the projection slice theorem in our notation, we're going to encode KX and KY or the position in K space with uh, two new parameters. One is K, which is the magnitude of this vector and theta, which is its direction. Okay, so it's in polar coordinates, basically. This is polar coordinates in K space. So we have a K value and a theta value, okay? K is given by KX squared plus KY squared and theta is just the orientation of, of the vector, okay? Uh, so now we have the Fourier transform of our UXY in terms of the polar coordinates representation of uh, that is this G K theta, okay? What happens now is uh, <clears throat> GK theta, right? Uh, for this one theta value, let's we'll fix our value of theta. Uh, is the Fourier transform of little g l theta, right? Uh, taken from this uh, projection with this theta value, okay? And so that is the projection slice theorem in our notation for this course, okay? Is that if I take the Fourier transform of my GL theta, I will get a uh, sampling along here of the Fourier transform of the whole image along this theta direction. You can uh, demonstrate for yourself that this works in certain uh, examples. Uh, so one would be a sync function, for example, that uh, you can demonstrate that the projection slice theorem works there. It's kind of trivial in the sense that uh, a square function or a rect function in 2D has a sync function, a 2D sync function as this Fourier transform. And if you take projections through this, you get a 1D rect function, which when you look in the Fourier space is a sample through the two-dimensional Fourier transform, which is the correct sync function, right? And so you can write down the, the algebra for doing that and show that that, that uh, comes up. Uh, if you want to go even further, you can say, well, let's take a projection at 45 degrees through the square, right? Or the, the 2D rect, we'll take that and show that the 45 degree projection through this thing. And that integral now is not as trivial, it's not a rect function anymore, it's actually a triangle function. Uh, you can show that that is a 45 degree sample through this function, okay? So we're not gonna do this algebra in class, but uh, you, you can work through it uh, if you want. So the practical uh, implications of this are, are pretty profound actually. So if, if this is my GL theta that we've measured on our detector and I have a, a function here, I can just take a one-dimensional Fourier transform and that gives me a sample through the Fourier transform of my image along some angle, right? So if I do that at many different thetas, I will wind up with this polar sampling of the Fourier space of my object, right? So if I interpolate this function onto a rectilinear grid, I could then just do the inverse 2D Fourier transform and have my picture, right? And so that's that's kind of a cool thing, right? In that in doing these uh, projections or integrals through the object at different angles, I now have taken that data and got myself in a situation where I know all of the spatial frequencies contained in that object and I can do an inverse Fourier transform to get the object back. Right? And it's it still is a little bit remarkable that that works, right? In that going through all these integrations such that all of the details along the line that we've done at integration get all folded into one number, right? And that number gets plotted here, right? 
but just the change in this function, right? As a function of position, when you go into Fourier space, gives you this sample such that you do get all of the details back out of the object. And of course, we need to take enough angles, right? So we need to sample this 2D function with high enough sampling in order to extract uh, enough data, right? If I didn't take enough angles, it'd be lot big gaps in my understanding of what the Fourier transform of this object is, which would lead to artifacts. So <clears throat> this leads us to uh, what it what will become the um, convolution back projection method, right? The understanding that what we've got in our sinogram, if we take these 1D Fourier transforms, is an estimate of the Fourier space of the object. So here's my estimate of the Fourier space of my object. I want to get to uh, mu xy, right? So if I did interpolate my function onto a linear uh, k space, so I so I took positions that were in polar coordinates and I interpolated them onto a on a rectilinear grid. Then I could do this inverse Fourier transform in dkx and dky to get my object. So that's one approach. The other approach is, well, let's just, we've got this, right, data. That's that's what we have. We have this estimate of the Fourier transform in polar coordinates, right? It's different than having it in rectilinear coordinates. So I've got it in polar coordinates right now. How do I take the Fourier transform in polar coordinates, right? Well, you just change the variables of this equation. This is the Fourier transform. We're going to do a variable change. And you've all done this in calculus, right? Where instead of dkx and dky, I'm going to do dk and d theta. I'm going to go to polar coordinates, right? So you've, everybody's done that, right? Before I go to Cartesian to polar. In doing that transformation from Cartesian to polar, we need uh, basically to transform the differential with the Jacobian, right? And for that transformation, remember in polar coordinates, your, your differential becomes r dr d theta. In this case, it's k dk d theta. Okay. And so this is our Jacobian right here. And this is the Fourier transform in polar coordinates. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so... Here we are, inverse Fourier transform and polar coordinates to get back uh, to this, right? We have uh, X and Y here, and K is parameterized and theta is parameterized to give us the proper uh, phasor uh, location. Uh, when we, what we can do first, right, is we can uh, look at the, uh, Fourier transform of this function here, k, g, k, d theta, just glom that together. And uh, through the definition of what L is, uh, this is k times L, this uh, phasor up here, right here. And so uh, we can take this Fourier transform as a function of k, right? So k is variable here, g, G varies with K and here's our phasor. So we're going to do this 1D transform inside our 2D transform first. And that's going to give us a new function, right? We know if we just took the inverse Fourier transform of this, we know what that is, right? That's just GL theta. We know from here, that's how we got GK theta. We took the Fourier transform of GL theta, right? So we know that if if this was in here and I took the inverse Fourier transform of this thing, I would just get GL theta. When I put this factor in front of it, this K, and do the in 1D Fourier transform, I now get G asterisk L theta, right? D theta. So what the heck is G asterisk L theta? So <clears throat> when we look at it, it's basically 
uh, th this is the equation, right? If we take out this 1D Fourier transform right here and just isolate it, uh, look at this integral. What are we going to use? We're going to use the convolution theorem, right? Which we learned two lectures ago or whatever, such that this is a function, this is a function, the product, so the Fourier transform of the product, right? In the opposite space is the convolution of those two functions, Fourier transforms. So I know the Fourier transform of this is GL theta. I know the inverse Fourier transform of K is the inverse Fourier transform of K, right? And so I convolve those two things, right? And that gives me what this G star L theta function is. It's GL theta, our original GL theta, convolved with this thing, which is the inverse Fourier transform of K, right? So what's K? Yeah, yeah. Oh, because we're integrating over it, right? The, this is the integration in the K direction, right? Uh, so we've taken it, we're just looking at this isolated part here, right? So in this, theta is actually a constant while we do this integration over K, okay? So uh, what does K look like as a function? Remember, we, we have all of these, this, our library of Fourier transforms, right? And so a Gaussian looked like this, it was a bell curve, right? We had a rect looked like this, it was a went up to one, came down to zero. K, okay, it's just it's just R if if you're in polar coordinates, right? So it just it's just this, right? It's like basically the absolute value of K is is like y equals x, right? Going up in all directions. Right. So so you have a function that's zero at the origin and it comes up like this, right? And we're going to take the Fourier transform of that function. And then that'll give us a function in space, in the L space along our detector you know, direction that we convolve GL theta with. And then after we do that, after we do that uh, convolution, we have this function G asterisk L theta. And to get back to mu xy, we, here's G asterisk L theta. All we do is add all those up. Right, just the way we did the naive back projection, we're going to add these functions up, which are are after that convolution, we'll add them up. Okay, so um, here's a version. <clears throat> so here's GL theta, right? We take a Fourier transform, we get this function GK theta here, right? We can multiply it, right, by this is the function that is the magnitude or the absolute value of k. It's this ramp. And that's here. We multiply gk theta by the ramp. And then we take its inverse Fourier transform here. The inverse Fourier transform. And basically, this gives us a filtered projection and we back project those things. The alternative way of doing it is in space, right? When we go back to space, we take our original GL theta, we convolve that original GL theta with the inverse Fourier transform of K. It looks all like this. So now we have a convolved projection on the back of that cell. We can do it either way. So let's do a quick example. This is the only right, which is again, it's it's the projections through a disk type object, right? When we convolve GL theta with the Fourier transform of a ramp, right? And we do that convolution, this function turns into this. It's profoundly different, right? We were back projecting these things to get our first images. And we got those blurry images where we had a peak, you know, and things like that. Now we're gonna back project these things. We're gonna have a flat top here. Well, that's an improvement, 
right? We had a, a disc. And we're going to back project something that has a flat top instead of something that has a you know round top if I'm trying to build a disc from back projection. And it has these negative side lobes, right? Which are like these deep side lobes at, at edges, right? Which is quite different than this, right? And so if you take these functions and you you back project it and back project it and back project it back, then you, you get your object back and the background is flat and you, you actually get the correct object. So here was our sinogram. This is the original sinogram. This is G star L theta. This is what it looks like after the convolution is done, right? So we get negative numbers, right? Uh, and um, it, it basically, you know, this, this goes to, the background goes to zero and there's negative and positive numbers. And when we back project these functions, right? So this is back projecting 40, 80, 120. Our total number is 240, right? Uh, and then finally 240, we get the object back, right? And so what we've done is we've figured out just using calculus, basically, just like, oh, we have to use the Jacobian if our data is in polar coordinates in the Fourier space in order to do the inverse Fourier transform We'll do it in polar coordinates. There's a Jacobian in there that is K, absolute value of K. And that K makes all the difference, right? Because when you do that inverse Fourier transform, you actually get the original object back, right? So that's how you do the reconstruction. And that's called convolution back projection. And that's been done for like 40 years, right? And the way it was has been implemented on systems was usually like this. Because these convolutions, 1D convolutions, could be done very quickly on array processors. And the back projection could be done quickly on array processors. And so that's the way CT has been done for a long time. Right? If everything's perfect, this is the way that gives you the original picture. Right? So this is correct. It, 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 if you have enough samples and there's not a lot of noise and things like that, this gives you the right answer. Okay, so we'll stop there and we'll take it up on Monday. Okay. Um, Dr. McVeigh? Yes. Uh, sorry, I just had a quick question. Um yeah. So I was wondering, um, I know there's no MATLAB component um, for the second homework, but I was wondering, um, are we still allowed to use like, you know, if it's useful for a problem like MATLAB sure. or things? Okay. Absolutely. Use MATLAB, Python, whatever you need to use. You're welcome to use it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, no sweat. Bye. Bye. Yeah, I also, I can take a